AP Biology, Chapter 22, Evolution, Part 2. Today we're going to look into some of the evidence for evolution. We've already taken some notes on artificial selection. Now we're going to go into the fossil record. After we get done with the fossil record, we'll talk about the anatomical record, some of the similarities that we see between different species as well as the differences and how to interpret that. We're going to look also into embryological development and the similarities between closely related species or species with a shared common ancestor and some of the stages they go through in development. We'll be talking about DNA later on in different parts. And uh, we've already gone through artificial selection. The only way that we really know what existed prior to uh, the stuff that actually left behind uh, dead bodies of different animals and plants is the fossil record. The fossils uh, that we see in the rocks are the remains and impressions of life in the past. And by analyzing those remains, we can try to get a clear understanding of what happened in the past. The fossils uh, that we find are always made out of sedimentary rock. The three types of rock are metamorphic, igneous, and um, and sedimentary. Igneous rock comes from cool down magma. Metamorphic rock is any rock that's been under heat and pressure and partially melted. Uh, both igneous and metamorphic rock do not uh, make for good uh, fossil making because they are uh, kind of uh, uh, high temperature processes that make both those rocks. For example, if a T-Rex fell into a lava pit, there wouldn't be much left of it uh, once that lava cooled down and became igneous rock. Sedimentary rock is the gentlest uh, formation of, uh, of a rock. Basically, it's glued together pieces of little tiny uh, rocks to, to make sedimentary rock. The fossils within the layers show that a succession of organisms have populated the Earth throughout a long period of time. And we have a general trend of going from simple in the oldest of rock layers of sedimentary rock to more complex over time that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Here are some fossils. Fossils are once again an impression of the dead remains of plants and animals. We have uh, in Colorado some fossils uh, that you can observe at Dinosaur Ridge that are actually still part of the rock layers. We have petrified wood, which is, has no real wood left in it. It's all been replaced by minerals. It's all rock. You can have the dead remains of uh, insects and arachnids and other critters trapped in amber. However, the cells, the DNA inside the cells, have long since uh, broken down. We have impression of leaves and other aquatic organisms, um, like nautils. Using the fossil record, we can try to piece together what happened in the past and how life has changed over time. For example, elephant fossils show a general increase in size over the last 30 million years. We also have fossils of horses, and uh, horses also show the same increase in size over time. Here we have a modern horse, and here we have ancient horses. As far as hypothesizing why size would be selected for, well, probably the same reason it's selected for, uh, or was selected for in dinosaurs, as well as other large critters. A larger horse is harder to take down than a smaller horse. You can run faster, you can kick wolves in the head with your back legs. All those things become more easy to do with a larger horse. We also have transitional fossils for a variety of different forms. Here we have the Archaeopteryx that lived about 150 million years ago during the time of dinosaurs. This is a reptile or uh, a transitional fossil linking reptiles to birds. It has features of reptiles. It uh, has some of the same bone structures. It has teeth like a reptile, not like a beak like a bird. Uh, however, it does have feathers as well. And uh, this is thought to be a, a missing link between reptiles and birds. At this time, we're going to take some notes. We have the uh, fossil record. You should know that dead organisms are found in sedimentary rock. Igneous rock and metamorphic rock are too destructive to uh, preserve fossils, but sedimentary rock, gluing together little pieces of uh, 
of sand and other things uh, is a gentle process. So once the bacteria uh, have eaten away the fleshy bits of a uh, organism, then what's left behind are the bones, and then the bones are replaced by minerals over time in most fossils. Things like uh, iron oxide uh, leaves an impression of the hard parts left behind. It's a record of life in the past and transitional fossils like modern day forms to the ancestors. We have a process called radiometric dating of igneous rocks, not sedimentary rocks, to find the absolute age or the actual age of a rock. The reason why we don't use sedimentary rocks for radiometric dating is that it's made up of different pieces of rock in a sedimentary rock. You might have one piece that's a million years old, one that's 100 million years old, one that's a billion years old. There's no way to accurately date a sedimentary rock. However, igneous rocks, as we're going to talk about later, trap uh, radioactive isotopes within them, and you can use those, the decay of those isotopes to figure out how old they are. Relative dating is used to determine which of the two fossils is older when you find uh, a couple of fossils. Generally speaking, um, if you have two fossils, one lower than the other, the lower fossil is older. And the reason why is because um, that layer of sediment and that rock layer had to be formed first before this other layer formed. So um, the lower la layer is going to be older than the upper layer. However, it really doesn't tell you which one is older or which one, how old the fossils are. It just tells you that the lower one is older. Some more notes. Pause at any time to catch up on taking these notes. Radiometric dating is used on igneous rocks and they trap radioactive isotopes like uranium. Uh, Half-life is the amount of time, that's abbreviation for amount, of time for half of the radioactive substance to decay into a non-radioactive stable element it will become. For example, carbon-14 is radioactive, it's the radioactive version of carbon, and it will decay into nitrogen in 5,000 years, uh, half the material will decay into uh, nitrogen in 5,000 years. So 5,000 years is one half-life for carbon-14. Pause at this time and get your notes done. All right, so now we're going to go into a radiometric uh, dating example, and that's what we have at the top here. We have uranium-235. This is a um, radioactive element, uranium. It has 700 million years as a half-life or it takes 700 million years for uranium-235 for half the substance to turn into PB or lead. So when the rock forms, when a rock first cools, you get uranium trapped inside. So when the rock was first formed, it'll, always, it'll have just uranium and no lead as far as uh, decayed uh, substance that uh, that the uranium will actually become. However, in 700 million years, half of that uranium, or six milligrams of uranium, will turn into lead, and that would be one half-life, or 700 million years. So let's say we have a rock sample, and this is our rock that we're gonna analyze. Let's write that in, rock sample analyzed. And uh, this is a pie graph. They use something called a mass spectrometer to analyze the uh, amount of uh, different elements in a rock sample. If the rock sample has three milligrams of uranium and nine milligrams of lead, you can kind of figure out how old that uh, rock is. And uh, the first thing you have to do is figure out how many half-lives have gone by. So let's do a little practice here. One half-life would result in 12 milligrams of uranium turning into six milligrams of uranium. And the other six milligrams would be lead, PB. So in one half-life, you would have six milligrams lead and six milligrams of uranium. Now, if another half-life goes by, that uranium, half of this uranium, will turn into lead. So in another half-life, half of six is three. We'll have a total of nine, three milligrams of lead, PB, and uranium will be three milligrams. So here we have one half-life, two half-lives. Move this up a little bit. We have one half-life, two half-lives, so if each half-life is 700 million years, two half-lives would be 1,400 uh, million years, or 1.4 billion years old. And that's two half-lives that have gone by. Notice that it's a ratio 
of the radioactive isotope to the decayed element will become to figure out the half-life. You need more than just the amount of uranium. You have to figure out how much uranium is left compared to the thing it will become, which in this case will be lead. There's a variety of different uh, radioactive elements that are used for trying to date rocks, and uh, uranium is one of the more common ones for longer, um, longer time spans. Something like uh, carbon-14 wouldn't be used for rocks uh, that are old because it's only good for about 50,000 years. As you can imagine, as each half-life goes by, let's say we have another half-life goes by, so now we only have 1.5 milligrams of uranium, and another half-life, and another half-life, and another half-life, and another half-life, eventually you get to a, a, so, so, such a small amount of uranium that you can't accurately measure it. So each um, radioactive isotope has a different range for its uh, usefulness. View how radiometric uh, dating works, and let's move on. So, how do we date rocks? How do we put this stuff together? Well, it's a mixture of relative dating and absolute dating. Let's go ahead and copy this down. So, let's say we find uh, fossil layers. So let's say we have sedimentary rock. We have one that's younger, one that's older, two fish, and this is going to be sedimentary rock. We can't date the age of the rock directly. This is relative dating. We just know the older fossil is the lower one. However, occasionally things like magma flows, lava, uh, earthquakes spewing forth igneous rock will, uh, will occur, and we can radiometrically date those layers. So if we have a layer of igneous rock above the sedimentary rock and a layer of igneous rock below it, we can figure out the age of the, um, the fossils in between. So if we use radiometric methods and find the top layer here is 200 million years old, MYO is million years old, and this lower layer is 300 million years old, we know that these fossils are somewhere in between 200 and 300 million years old. And that's how we figure out the age of fossils. And um, sometimes we use index fossils. If we find, like, let's say, a T. rex fossil, T. rex, we know that T. rex lived during the uh, Cretaceous. So that would also be used to kind of help out with uh, trying to figure out a new fossil that we find. Now, the Cretaceous was a little bit uh, closer to present day. It wasn't 200 million years ago. So we would not expect to find too many T-Rexes, any T-Rexes, that far back. All right, so let's put all this stuff together. Let's see what we uh, actually find found out as far as the, the age of this planet and what we found in the rock layers. So we're going to go and copy this down. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. All right, this is going to require a full page, so get a fresh sheet of paper out. And let's go in and label this sedimentary rock fossils. These are all the different things that we find in the fossil layers and some of the major events in the history of life on this planet that we uh, discovered that geologists as well as paleontologists have figured out over time. The first thing we're going to write down is the oldest fossil layers. So these are the different fossil layers, and we're kind of generalizing here. Um, you can see all these things in museums or go out to the the actual rock layers themselves and observe this. The oldest rocks we find on this planet are 4.6 billion years old, and let's go and write that down. That's uh, thought to be the age of the Earth. So, oldest rock. And let's write in age of Earth, as determined by radiometric dating. Then, uh, for almost a billion years, no life at all, okay? Earth is cooling down, a lot of geologic activity, we have an atmosphere that is uh, methane and carbon dioxide. If you didn't have a, if you went back in time to Precambrian times, uh, you would suffocate without a gas mask or a, an oxygen supply. Then, at 3.5 billion years old, we find the oldest fossils of life. The first life are bacteria, stromatolites. Stromatolites are fossil beds of bacteria. Nothing more. No complex animals at all. This. Um, this is the Precambrian era, and the Precambrian era went from 4.6 billion years ago to 540 million years ago. The way that humans have decided these eras is by major extinction events. So every time there's an extinction event, we can write that in, uh, we have a uh, new era, basically, that uh, we make. Now, this uh, Precambrian extinction uh, was pretty major. 90% of all life uh, died out. This is actually the biggest one um, that occurred in Earth's history even bigger than the one that dinosaurs died out of. All right, so at 1.5 billion years ago, and let's go and star some of these. These are key uh, events in Earth's history. Uh, at 1.5, 1.7 billion years ago, we have photosynthesizers producing oxygen in the atmosphere. 
then we have at 550 million years ago life in the oceans and uh, we finally mean find mainly invertebrates or no backbones cousins to things like spiders and insects and crustaceans existed at this time uh, trilobite fossils are very common during this uh, this time period at 500 million years ago we find the first fish uh, after the Precambrian extinction, there was an explosion of life, and fish started to evolve at this time. The Paleozoic, paleo means old, and the Paleozoic era is often called the age of fish. This will end uh, part two, and we'll continue on with part three.